Good morning, everyone. Please turn in your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Our text reads, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The epistle to the Galatians answers the question, what place does law-keeping have in our salvation? The answer is none. Christ has set us free from the curse of the law. This verse tells us how Christ accomplished that. The Galatians, I find it often that the epistle to the Galatians really resonates with me because I wasn't raised in a Christian um, background. Uh, there, not just my family, but where I lived. Uh, there was a Buddhist temple not far from my house. When I was a kid, got in trouble with the, uh, with the Buddhist priest there, me and my friend did, because they had this big giant bell that had this um, big wooden pole on chains that hung beside it, and they would ring it, uh, had something to do with their worship and being mischievous boys one day we were walking by it and we ran up grabbed it bong and they came out and got mad at us <laughs> only time we ever did that <laughs> so I was around um, a lot of different belief systems growing up and my my dad he didn't hold to any one religious system and so I was exposed to a lot of different things and didn't have any real solid groundwork growing up in what to believe. And uh, basically a secular house uh, growing up. And so uh, the situation of the Galatians um, really uh, uh, resonated with me when I studied the epistle because the Galatians, these weren't Jews that got converted to Christianity these were pagans who worshipped a multiplicity of gods and they had accepted Christ as their savior. And a situation happened was that people came along in after they were um, converted to Christ through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. People came in along after them and told them, okay, well now that you believe, you have to basically become Jews. You have to be circumcised and obey all the um, traditions and laws of, uh, of Judaism in order to be saved, in order to, to be accepted by God. And the Apostle Paul heard about this and sent this epistle to deal with that situation. And... It answers some questions, it answers this question, you know, a big part of the epistle is dealing with the question, what place does the law, law keeping, in fact, the Apostle Paul, when I uh, taught through the epistle, you may remember, I showed that the Apostle Paul equates the Judaic system with any belief system that focuses on the doing of works to earn favor with God. So it doesn't necessarily have to be following law, Moses' law, any system where you believe that what you do earns you favor with God, can you know, you know, gain you acceptance by God. Any system that believes that is a law-keeping system. And so a big part of the epistle deals with that question, what place does law-keeping have in our salvation? And that answer is none. And it also answers the question, now that you're saved, how are you supposed to live? And so that's why that really resonated with me because I felt that my background was the same as the Galatians, a non-religious background coming out of secular thinking. Well, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live? But we're going to be focusing on this, on the, on the aspect of how does it relate to our salvation? How are we saved? Not the how are we supposed to live after we are saved, but
but focus on the salvation part. The first part I want to deal with is the curse of the law. What does that mean? You know, we, we, you, you almost never hear the word curse, except in um, fanciful uh, entertainment, where there's stories that you're reading to your children or a movie that talk about, you know, curses, witches' curses. Uh, used to be synonymous with uh, foul language. That evolved into the word cussing. Cussing comes from cursing. But a... Uh, I found that the definition in the original languages didn't really help because it just says, basically, it means curse. Um, it's the word katara, and katara means, um, it says, an execration, an imprecation, a curse. And in brackets, you see next to extrication, an expression of detesting. So it basically says it means curse. So, so what does that mean? Then I, uh, I thought that Webster's definition of the English word curse kind of illuminates it a little bit for us. Webster's definition is a prayer or invocation for harm or injury to come upon one. Um, cursing isn't like a, a bad spell. Cursing is any time you say, I hope you get what you deserve Heard one fellow mad at someone who was eating, you know, the person was eating and he was mad at them about something. He goes, I hope you choke on that. That's a curse. You're, you're wishing harm on someone. You hope harm or something bad happens to them. So it's a pronouncement of, of bad things against someone. And so this passage tells us that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And what was that curse? Well, there were two parts to it. There were conditions that had to be met to avoid its consequences. So the curse was basically, you know, if you, if you were to put in another you know, framework is, may this happen to you if you don't do thus and thus. And you see that a lot um, where in the Old Testament, individuals would place themselves under a curse. And they would say, God, do so and more to me if... So they're saying that, you know, invoking a curse against themselves. First part is its conditions. You know, what was required to avoid the penalty of the curse, the punishment of the curse. That condition placed us in bondage or slavery to the law. Galatians 3.10, just a few verses before our passage, says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And then back in the Old Testament, we have uh, Deuteronomy 27, 26, which says, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say, Amen. So the curse of the law, the, the conditions of the curse of the law that had to be met was a continual obedience to the law. Disobeying the law in any of its points brought the penalty of the curse upon the person, brought its consequences. So that was the curse. They had to obey the law absolutely, continually. They were, it was a continuing thing. It wasn't do this test. If you, if you succeed, you're fine. It was every day for the rest of your life. You have to obey the law. If you break it, you come under its penalty. Consequences. What was the consequences of the curse? Separation from God. Matthew 24, 41. Christ, speaking about the judgment, says, In that day it will be said... 
Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I want you to, to, to note here that the people are labeled the cursed. So these are the people who come under the penalty of the curse. It has come upon them. And the first thing he says is, depart from me. Everyone likes to focus on the, the, the hellfire. But notice that the first thing he says is, depart from me. So separation from God. Secondly, Luke chapter 13, verse 28. And this is where I want to show you the emphasis on the separation. Where there's no hellfire talked about, but the focus is on separation. Luke 13, 28. There shall, weeping, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out, driven out, separated from God, not allowed to be with the Lord. Now, mind you, I'm not denying the existence of, of hell, but I'm saying here that the main thrust of the penalty of the curse is separation from God. Now, how is it, the second part of this verse I want to address, is redemption from the curse. So the curse is, if you do not continuously and perfectly obey the law, then you come under its curse. And that means that you will be driven from the presence of God for all eternity. And there is great suffering in that. And we'll get to that here after a bit. But how did, how did Christ redeem us? I want to first talk about what does the word redeem mean? The word redeem here is exagorazo, which means to redeem my payment of a price, to recover from the power of another, to ransom, to buy off. So two modern illustrations of this. Redemption would be if you had sold an item to a pawn shop to get cash, and then later on you get the funds together and you go back to the pawn shop to get your item back, that is redeeming. You're purchasing it to get it back to yourself. And then the other is ransom, where um, someone is under the power, someone you care about is under the power of another, and you pay a fee to that person so that you can get your loved one back little quick uh, humorous side note. Uh, one of my great-grandfathers is named Ransom, Ransom Franklin Porter, and one of Heidi's great-grandfathers is named Freed, F-R-E-E-D. So, so Ransom and Freed. <laughs> so when it says redeemed from the curse is, remember what it says before, we were under slavery under the law with a doom over us that if we failed a doom would come on us the curse of the law and so Christ purchased us out from under that bondage out of that slavery how did he do this how did he execute that Christ became accursed of God. You know, the Bible says that he was without sin, that he always did that which pleased God, that he never in any way 
failed to obey God. And he said at one point to the, um, to the Jews, he said, if you're going to accuse me of a sin, what sin do you accuse me of? And they couldn't. They couldn't accuse him. In fact, they had to get false witnesses who just lied. So he himself was not guilty of ever breaking the law, but he became um, the person who suffered the penalty of that curse. Galatians 3.13 says that Christ, the second half of it says that Christ um, redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse. It says, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. This is a quote from Deuteronomy, which is, you know, Deuteronomy is the core of the law. Deuteronomy 21, 22 through 23. Um, and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God. Or an, an alternate, you know, more literal um, translation would be, um, in Hebrew, would be the curse of God. He becomes the curse of God. You, you sometimes in, in Hebrew, the reason why sometimes they'll have these uh, multiple marginal translations is that Hebrew um, had a smaller vocabulary than English does, and some of their words and phrases were used in multiple ways, and so you have to look at the context. They had a, um, they had a tendency, almost every word had a concrete meaning and an abstract meaning. Like an example would be the verb to physically unwind something also meant to become out of control. And so they had a lot of words like that. They had, you know, a concrete, you know, physical meaning and then an abstract meaning. A lot of their words are like that. And so um, I remember one time we were translating a passage and our, we told the professor said, we were supposed to translate a specific verse, but there was a word in the verse they said, and we, and the, the, we were working as a group, and we told our teacher, said, we're going to have to translate a couple more lines to figure out what that word means in context. Because he, he demanded that we justify every translation, you know, that we show proofs as to why we translated it that way. And so you get that sometimes with Hebrew. So it could be taken a couple of ways depending on uh, the surrounding context. It says that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So Christ, when he was crucified, he became, that is symbolic of the fact that he became the cursed one. He took on the curse of God. And he was without sin. And this was well known enough that one of the thieves on the cross said, we deserve to die, but this man has done nothing worthy of death. So Christ became, redeemed us by the law, by taking on the curse of the law, its penalty on himself. Now, we ought not to think of that as a light thing. I want you to look at the, the torment of this. Remember, I said that the core of the penalty of the curse of the law is separation from God. And Christ's reaction to being crucified, I think, brings this out strongly. You know, I think I would be tempted after having been beaten so severely and then nailed to a, a cross and then having people pelting stuff at me. I think I would be like going, man, this hurts so bad. I am in such pain. I think I'd be groaning about the pain. But here from Christ on the cross, 
Hear what he cries out about. In, uh, and this is a prophetic passage. I actually put them in reverse order of what I intended. Can we bring up Matthew 27 first? Matthew 27 first. And then the psalm. I can bring up both at the same time. Sure, do that. So I'm going to read Matthew 27 and then we'll go back and look at the prophetic verse. Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, the reason why it's written here in two languages um, is because in the Greek manuscripts, he didn't say it in Greek. He said it in uh, Aramaic which is a, a close relative to Hebrew. There's just a few, a few differences between Aramaic and Hebrew. My uh, Hebrew professor, he said, I could teach you the differences in one class. Uh, one of the differences you know, off the top of my head is that Hebrew per, per pluralizes by the im ending, I am. Aramaic pluralizes by I n, so im and in. So he said it in Aramaic, and then they translated what he said. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Eli means my God. El is God, E is my. So my God, my God, lama, la is for, ma is what, for what, which meant why. And then sabachta is you have forsaken, and ni is the direct object, me. So, my God, my God, for what have you forsaken me? This is prophetic fulfillment of Psalm chapter 22. The whole psalm is prophetic, talking about Christ and what he suffered for us. And it says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art, why art thou so far from helping me? Hebrew, my salvation. The word help is often translated save. And from the words of my roaring. Do you hear the agony? My roaring. Jesus, having been beaten bloody, being tortured by the people around him, ridiculed and cursed by the people around him, what does he cry out about? When his heart is so full, when he's so full of pain, what does he say? He says, does, it, does he talk about his aching back or his throbbing hands and feet? What hits him? What overwhelms him and causes him to cry out in anguish, anguish is the separation from God. I don't think, I say I don't think, but we can't know while we live what that's like. Because even the vilest sinner who walks upon the face of the earth has not been separated completely from God. John chapter 1, it, it's not in my notes, but John chapter 1 says that God lights every man that enters the world. The Bible says that all things consist by God, that he's holding everything together. God is constantly working in us. And the Bible says that he's constantly trying to draw us to himself that this is happening all the time. The vilest sinner doesn't know what it means to be separated from God while he yet walks upon the face of the earth. What are the results of this redemption? So Christ, he suffered your separation from God so that you could be set free from the slavery to the law. 
So what are the results of this? Well, further on in the chapter, chapter 3, verse 26, it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The result of this sacrifice by Christ, wherein he sacrificed himself for you, you become the children of God. The Bible in John chapter 1, it says that his own, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, that is, authority, to become the children of God. So instead of being separated because of our sin, our disobedience, we become part of his family. How? By faith in Christ. By trusting in his finished work on the cross. Often we will use the word, and I think that it can be deceiving, in modern English, we will use the word pardoned by God. But we use that word, in, in, at least in our legal system, a lot differently than former times it was used. A pardon isn't what happened as we use the word pardon now. That is not what happened with Christ. I have used uh, this before. I said, you know, in legal parlance a mistrial is where they call off the trial because um, the prosecutor messed up somehow or the people handling the evidence messed up and the judge declares a mistrial and so charges have to be refiled and they have to go through the whole process again an acquittal is where the courts say you aren't guilty. You didn't do it. To be judged guilty is they, they judge that you're guilty of the crime. And then they levy a punishment. And then a pardon is that you were judged guilty, but you are uh, released from the penalty of the crime. Uh, presidents have the power of pardon. And so many... I don't know if all presidents have uh, used that power, but many presidents over the years have used that power to pardon people. They are released from the penalty of their crimes. None of those happened in Christ's salvation. There was no mistrial. We were tried and judged guilty of sin. Guilty of breaking God's law. We weren't acquitted. We, we were found guilty. But we weren't pardoned. Because a pardon means that we got out of being punished. That we were released from the punishment. What happened was we were found guilty. The punishment was pronounced, which is death. And it was executed. But not on us. It was executed on Christ. He suffered the execution in our stead. But it has to be received by faith. It doesn't universally apply. There is a condition. It must be accepted by faith in Christ. He's already paid the penalty, but you must accept it. Conclusion to this passage. Law keeping is slavery with the promise of separation from God. Why is that such a bad thing? A lot of people don't understand how terrible I think, because they don't take into account everything that the Bible says. They don't consider how terrible a thing that would be to merely be separated from God. But the Bible declares in James 1.17 
that every good thing comes from God. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There is nothing pleasurable in your life but that it came from God. The air you breathe, the food you eat, everything you Everything you have has been received. The Bible declares that God is the source of life, light, and love. You can't have these things without God. I have heard people rebel about the concept of hell, and I came to this conclusion based on an understanding of what the Bible says here, that everything good comes from God. You can't reject God and still get good things because there is no source from which the good things come other than God. Everything good, beautiful, pleasurable comes from God. He's the source of all these things. We tend to see presented this picture of God you know, disconnected from the world, this old man in robes who every once in a while deigns to um, smite or bless arbitrarily. But what the Bible presents is a picture of God continuously working in the world. Jesus said that God is feeding the birds. He's feeding the wild animals. He cares about you so intimately that he knows every detail about you down to the numbers of the hairs on your head. I was thinking about the level of awareness that that would require. Anaya and Catherine walked past my field of vision and it took a moment for me to register that neither of those little people were part of my family. Is there, are any of those mine? No. <laughs> Heard someone one time say about fathers that fathers tend to be vaguely aware that there are small people that live in the house. <laughs> I know I can kind of fall into that thing. I just I get so thought focused. People ask me, is there something wrong? No, just thinking. But God is intimately aware of us, cares about us. He's constantly working in us. The Bible says that it is God that works in us to will, that is to desire and to do of his good pleasure. Constantly, constantly working in us. And to be separated from God would be to be separated from everything that's good. Consider that to be separated from God by our choice, the offer is made. Christ has died for you already. And all that God says now is receive. What are we receiving? We are receiving Christ. We are receiving God himself. And if we refuse, then God allows us our choice. But that choice comes with consequences. And that means you are separated from God. And to be separated from God means you don't get light. You get darkness. You don't get life. You get death. And you don't get love. You get despair. Separation from God is a terrible thing that causes, as the Bible says, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. I remember reading that verse a long time ago and thinking, how bad would your suffering have to be that you're basically chewing on yourself? You're... 
And one day, uh, I had a, uh, a severe bacterial infection that was, the suffering of it was so severe that I, I literally did not sleep for a couple of days. In fact, I finally, I went to the doctor. They drew some blood and sent me back home. And all of a sudden, I get this call. And they said, you need to go to the emergency room. And I said, why? They said, sir, you need to go to the emergency room. All right, why? Sir, are you going to go to the emergency room? Yeah, why? And I heard this exasperated you know, sigh, and they said, sir, your white cell blood, your white cell count, white blood cell count is elevated. You need to get to the emergency room. I was like, oh, okay. And I got there, and he immediately put me on a bed, put an IV in me, and started pumping um, antibiotics into me. And after a bit, the doctor came in and was talking to me. I had a, a systemic bacterial infection. I was like, why are you guys seeming like you're freaking out? They said, sir, you were going, your body was going into shock. Yeah, so? So that meant you could have died? I was like, oh, okay. But that was so bad. The night before I went to the hospital, and please understand, I'm not exaggerating, I'm not playing this up. The suffering was so bad on that, I realized my teeth were grinding. I was pacing back and forth because I hurt so bad and I felt so horrible, I couldn't sit still. I was pacing back and forth and I realized my teeth were just grinding. It wasn't a conscious decision. They were just grinding on themselves. And I remember begging God to heal me or kill me. It hurt so bad. I wanted it to stop. It was, a, it was when the bacterial infection had gone systemic, and they said that means it's affecting your whole body at that point, that you've gotten blood poisoning at this point. And then I understood this verse. An agony so terrible that you're just uh, grinding your teeth as an expression of your suffering. Crying out continuously and, and grinding your teeth because you're suffering so greatly. That's what se separation from God causes. But this is by the person's choice. We choose to reject God. Christ has made the sacrifice. Payment has been made. We, our freedom is possible. But we choose to reject God. Jesus Christ suffered that separation of God when he was crucified. He suffered that separation to set us free and become the children of God. We become the children of God when we accept Christ's sacrifice by faith. Separation is a burden too heavy to bear. You don't have to bear that. Be set free. While you walk on the earth, you still have a chance to be saved. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You don't have to die without Christ. You don't have to die and be separated from God forever and to suffer that endless suffering of being separated from God. He doesn't want you to. God is not willing, that is, that he does not desire that anyone should perish. He doesn't want you to die. God isn't that arbitrary picture of uh, someone who likes to just smite people at random likes to hurt people at random. Rather, what we find in the Bible is the cry of God's heart. Oh, why will you die? 
Christ saying to the people of Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how many times would I have gathered you under my wings like a mother hen her chicks? And you hear the heartbreaking words, but you would not. You still have hope. You're sitting. How do I know that? Because you're sitting here, breathing, hearing my words. There is still hope for you. You can be set free from your sin. The God that loved you enough to pay your penalty is giving you this opportunity right now. We don't know how long we have. God says it's given unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Don't think that if you die, you get to go before God and plead your case. The offer is open now. The chance is open now. Don't pass it up. God doesn't want you to die, but he will not force you to choose because he wants a love relationship with you. And love has to be chosen. Please don't miss this opportunity. Friend, if you're sitting here and your faith is already in Christ and you are one of his children, consider the billions that live in our world. The billions that live in our world who have never heard the gospel, who yet walk in darkness, who are separate from God and will fully experience that when they die unless we share the gospel with them and they receive it. That's the two parts. We can't force people to be saved. Our clever arguments and our, our programs aren't going to save people the gospel does but there's always the chance that they will refuse but the burden is on us to share the gospel god has said to us go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature you know i know that there are some in this country who are alarmed by the massive immigration we're experiencing from all over the world, I am not alarmed. I rejoice in that because I'm not inclined to travel outside the U.S., so I'm really happy that they're coming to me instead. And that's how I view it. These peop the people of the world need to hear the gospel. Hey, great news. They're coming to the U.S., Heidi has joked around that I can say, hi, how are you, in, all, in every language. That is not even close to the truth. There's over 7,000 spoken languages in the world, but I do know how to say, hi, how are you, in quite a few. And I have found, in my personal experience, that just learning even a little bit in another, about other people and their cultures and their background really opens doors with them understanding where they come from. I remember speaking to a family at Meyer. I heard her, I overheard this woman speaking to her children and I could tell by her accent that it wasn't, that she wasn't um, a native English speaker. And so I said, excuse me, ma'am, sorry to, to disturb you, but I was curious, where are you from? And at first she looked like, like this. She goes, Poland. I said, ah, Jin Dobre, Yak Shemash. And her face just lit up. Jin Dobre, Yak Shemash is, uh, Jin Dobre is good day, Yak Shemash is, how are you? And then you, and then you respond, Dobje, Ate? It's, I'm fine, how are you? you know? <laughs> and uh, she was just so excited by that. Um, one day, I was at Meyer and I saw this guy from India, and I could tell by the metal band around his wrist that he was um, a Sikh. And I said, Kihale. And he goes, Tige. And he goes, Why do you know Punjabi? <laughs> so I started talking to him, you know. 
So I like doing that. I, I want to understand it. And, and I find, especially with people of other cultural backgrounds, that it, it just makes it so easy to talk to people if I, if I know something about where they come from. Uh, Lithuanians are always blown away that I know they're from Lithuania and that I know their capital city is Vilnius. Just that little bit of knowledge, you know, just really excites them and opens up an opportunity. We, we ought not to be, friend, if you're a child of God, we ought not to be alarmed by this. We should be excited by this, excited by the opportunity to interact with people from other cultures and other countries and to share with them the love of God. Consider the consequences that you would have borne if Christ hadn't have died for you and someone hadn't have shared the gospel with you and you received him. Well, all of these people are going to bear that unless they receive Christ. Ought not we to have pity on them and love them enough to discomfort ourselves enough to tell them, you know, get out of our routine and out of our comfort zone and go to them and say, friend, Jesus Christ died for you. It is too easy to become self-focused. We need to stop and look around and see people. See them. They're hurting. They're suffering. They need help. And the answer is God. I had an opportunity to share the gospel with a woman at uh, Walmart because I helped her. Uh, she, had, uh, she had a broken arm. And I said, ma'am, I will load your car for you. Now, it turns out that she was at least a professing Christian. But I shared the gospel with her, and it was only afterwards that she you know, told me. We ought to look for those opportunities. Look for ways that we can you know, engage other people. And that's not always easy nowadays. I'm constantly looking around when I'm going places looking to make eye contact with people and try to engage with them. And this is often what I see. And then if I do say hi, <laughs> I've uh, knocked on doors and had people open the door. This, I kid you not, this is, this is one of the times. Knock on the door. <laughs> the owner holding back this evil looking dog. <laughs> what do you want? Hi, I'm from open... No, no, not interested. Close. <laughs> There's a guy, he's since moved, but he lives um, right here on um, Beeler. Knocked on his door. Well, nobody answered, so I put a track in his door. And he pulled into his driveway right after I did. And he goes, what is that? Just like that. What is that? And I said, uh, an invitational flyer to my church? He goes, no, go get it. So I went and got it and left. But we can't stop. Our culture in the U.S. has become very hardened against the things of God. But we can't stop. I was raised in a completely secular household. But you know what? I accepted Christ. You know how I accepted Christ? My friend, Robert Armstrong, asked me to go to church with him. I went to church with him. He never went to that church again. And I asked my mom, I said, Can, I want to I wanna go to church with my friend. Can you take me? So she did. And I heard the gospel, and God spoke to my heart. And I knew, even though I had no reason to believe so, I knew that the words he was saying were true. I don't know if he shared the actual gospel or if he just, covered the part that I was condemned because the only part I was latching on to was that I was condemned. 
And I knew that it was true of me. And I was crying. And my mom wanted to know what was wrong. And I told her. And so she took me to the pastor. And he was an old man. He was a World War II vet. His name was Carol Nichols. And he took me aside and he sat me on his, on his lap because I was just a you know, little boy. And he shared the gospel with me. And I accepted Christ as my Savior. Now, because my, we moved not long after that, and my parents weren't interested in taking me to church, so I went for a period of you know, no growth, but God didn't forsake me. And I came to a point in my late teens when I realized that I needed something more than what I had and what my parents had to offer me. And I made the decision to follow Christ, not just for salvation, but to follow him as a disciple and to let him teach me how to live and how to think. And I've never regretted that. All the odds were against me. I went to public school. My parents were not church people, secular. All the odds were against me, but I got saved. Surely, I can't have been the last one of those circumstances. Surely, that can't be the case. God's word is powerful. And his spirit is still working among us. God can still save the sinner. Have, have compassion on them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus who died for our sins and rose again to give us new life that whosoever believes in him should not die, but have everlasting life. I pray, Father, if there's any lost among us, that you might work in their hearts and lives now, that they might come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray for my fellow believers that you might work in their hearts, that they might be moved this week to speak to others about your great love for us. Bless now, Father. Work in us and through us, I pray. In the name of your Son, just pray all these things. Amen.